There is no true joy in conforming. But not everyone has what it takes to be different. Introducing a crossover coupe for those who have what it takes to break free. The all-new Infiniti QX55 with a dramatic style that defies expectations and turns heads. The Infiniti QX55. Lead the way. Let the world catch up. This is a Vault Studios production. I'm Reed Redmond. I'm Will Johnson. The show contains graphic material and is meant for mature audiences. This week on True Crime Chronicles. If, if Alicia was in trouble and she could have communicated with me, she would have called me. That's for sure. Everything else seemed like the night was still going on. The stove was still on. The TV was still on. Um, those bills were still on the counter. It just kind of seemed like everything else looked normal besides the fact that it was a huge crime scene. He called me and it was just, he said, Alicia's, he was vague, Alicia's not here with us. And you know, you're like, what do you mean? He, you know, and he said, she passed away. And I'm like, what? And I actually remember terminating the call at that moment. I'll be honest with you. Uh, I thought after three years, this thing would be settled. Matter of fact, the conversation I had with the Lord was, I don't know I could have been ready at the time. All this had just recently uh, opened up. Uh, you know, all kinds of emotions arise when you have somebody, some loved one uh, taken because you, you keep wondering, how can somebody hate somebody and be evil to that degree that they would take a life, especially in that fashion, and, and live with themselves? 25-year-old Alicia Jackson was murdered in late 2010. Her family still wants to know why. So we just keep hoping and trusting that, uh, I mean, I know one person that knows, and that's the Lord. He knows exactly everything that went down. And I believe vindication is going to occur at some point. Uh, you, you can run, but you can't hide. That's the way I look at it. So, uh, But in the meantime, I had to deal with it myself in a way where I wasn't vengeful and I wasn't bitter because that that could just destroy your life and I was determined not to let that happen when they say mental health is a journey they mean it that's why it's important to prioritize your mental health and wellness every day when you work on yourself it brings positive changes in all areas of your life the long-term effects of therapy can give you tools to deal with challenges as they arise, strengthen your relationships, and give you a more positive outlook on life. There's no better time to invest in yourself than right now. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform that has thousands of licensed therapists trained in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationships, and more. Your therapist can help you set and achieve your goals. Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy, and instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7, and they'll engage with you daily five days a week. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com. Make sure to use the code TCC to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's promo code TCC and Talkspace.com. Custom Inc. can help you recognize employees, show customer appreciation, and outfit your teams with your favorite products and brands, customized with your logo. At CustomInc.com, you can easily make your mark on all sorts of products, including water bottles, backpacks, polos, jackets, and so much more. Make Custom Inc. your go-to custom gear partner with great customer service, quality products, and all-in pricing, along with personalized help when you need it and an easy-to-use website when you don't. All backed by a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Go to customink.com to get started today. Reporter Alyssa Kratz had just started with local news station Fox 43 in central Pennsylvania when she learned about Alicia Jackson's case. I want to say maybe it was like February or March. Her Alicia's cousin, Sean Tay, who still lives in the Harrisburg area, as does Alicia's dad, um, the cousin reached out to our station Um asking us, you know, if we would be interested in speaking with them, doing kind of an update on where the case stands. First name, Shantae, S-H-A-U-N-T-A-Y, 
Last name, Jackson, J-A-C-K-S-O-N. And then your relation to Alicia, you were her cousin. I am her cousin, our first cousin. Our dads were brothers. Shantae Jackson told Alyssa Kratz that she and Alicia had always been close, even though they grew up in different states, with Alicia spending her younger years in Lexington, Kentucky. We spent summers together, whether I was going to Lexington for the summer or her and her brother Trevin would come here for the summer in this neighborhood at our grandmother who lives down the street. So we were close. And as I told someone else, um, we would call each other and run up. I don't know about my uncle, but I ran up my dad's phone bill with long distance back then because it was high. And it, we would talk about nothing, but we were close two years along with our older cousin, Nikki. It was like, you know, we were the three musketeers, like best friends as well as cousins. Alicia's younger brother, Trevin Jackson, also remembers being close with his sister growing up. She was a great older sibling, very supportive in the things that I wanted to do as a kid. And... I always wanted to include me in the time that she had with her friends or uh, just with us uh, as a whole. And with us being the only two family members around our age living in Kentucky at the time, we grew to be very close as siblings. And that was really our relationship, you know, from the beginning until the end. Alyssa Kratz also spoke to Alicia's father. Kevin Jackson. She was born uh, May the 7th, 1985. Um, one of my fondest memories of her was the uh, her laying on my chest uh, when she was very young and how that, it actually took that, put her to sleep sometimes. Um, but she was so small. She was pre, a preemie and I remember having the palm of her head, her head in the palm of my hand and her feet no more than to my elbow. When Alicia was about 15 years old, Kevin Jackson says he brought his family from Kentucky to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to be closer to family. Alicia's cousin, Shantae, was thrilled. That was one of the best things that happened to me. Like, she's moved, she lives here now. So I pretty much lived here with her and I was with her all the time. We went to the same church also. So it was every week, definitely. And then whatever we can get, you know, during the week, um, I just would be with her while he mentioned the step team that she was the head of. I'd go to practices with her. You know, everyone in this neighborhood knew me. So we were really close. She went to Central Dolphin East High School, which is in Harrisburg area. And it's actually funny, one of my coworkers went to high school with Alicia. So that was kind of a cool personal touch that I was able to, um, she still has some of her high school yearbooks. So that's kind of where I was able to snag some of those uh, yearbook photos and other things that I had in my story, some different elements. So, and her story of Alicia, what she knew of Alicia matched, you know, exactly what Alicia's family told me. And that was that she was just one of those people that everyone loved. And I mean, she was voted homecoming queen. She was voted, um, most likely to make the the biggest impact on the world or, you know, some, it was some sort of superlative like that her senior year, uh, she created a step team, like the, a dance team at her school that she was um, in charge of. And she just seemed like someone who, no matter you know whether she was your best friend or she knew you just kind of as an acquaintance, she was always kind and she would say hello to you. And she just seemed to be someone who was very ambitious. And you know she had these ambitions to go to college. After graduating high school in Pennsylvania, Alicia decided to move to Ohio where she would eventually get a master's degree from The Ohio State University. That's also where she met and fell in love with the man who would soon be her fiance, Eugene Wilson. She didn't express any, you know, like they were happy. So I didn't, at that time, I was young also. So from what I knew love was at that time, it was love to me. So I didn't think or have any second guessing like this wasn't a right situation. Um, you know, we talk. She didn't divulge much as far as that. You know, we talk, we told, but as far as like anything that could possibly give any type of signals or red flags, I didn't contain any of that information or have no thoughts like that. Alicia's family members soon learned that Alicia was pregnant. But around that same time, Alicia also learned that her fiance was having a child with another woman. I know it was closer to the end of her pregnancy that she became aware of um, his infidelities that led to the conceiving a child outside of their relationship. And that was hard for her, obviously. Um, Very stressful, you know, being a, a woman, a young woman at that, to think 
this, you know, my perfect family, so to speak, at that time. And then I have to deal with this. And it was like the ultimate rain on my parade because she was in getting ready to experience motherhood. And then she had this hurdle to jump over. Um, so that was around the end of her pregnancy, but she was very optimistic. You, you know, she was down, but she was definitely, you can tell her faith kept her strong through that situation. And she was very much so forgiving and she tried to find the good in any bad situation. According to Shantae, it was a difficult time for her cousin. But Alicia made the decision to patch things up with her fiancé. Being a young person, I'm pretty sure in her mind she still loved him. Um, I've been in, in situations like that also where you try to overlook the bad of others in hopes for a positive outcome. So yes, absolutely. And yes, having a child to him was also, I'm sure, a deciding factor. And there was a rough, rough patch, but she did ultimately decide to get through that, and she decided to move forward with Eugene, and she did voice that to us. It was like a couple months went by, and then she came to us and said, I am going to decide to get things right. Um, we're going to continue our relationship, you know, and in hopes that we can be have our happily ever after. Alicia eventually gave birth to a son. Her cousin says the child was the apple of Alicia's eye, her proudest accomplishment. She took pride in that, and you couldn't tell her nothing about that. And Alicia's father, Kevin Jackson, remembers the joy of becoming a grandfather. My favorite picture is right over there. That's the one where he and his mother came to uh, Hershey. We we came to Harrisburg, and we went to Hershey Park. And he was real little then. And uh, I remember uh, holding him up because he couldn't walk at that point. Uh, and uh, and I, I, I instantly made a connection with him. A couple of years after the birth of their son, Alicia and Eugene made plans to relocate to Texas. But those plans were suddenly and violently interrupted. Kevin Jackson, Alicia's father, remembers getting a phone call on the night of December 2nd, 2010. Got a phone call that evening, and uh, Sarah Wilson, who is Eugene's mother, called and said she had uh, some disturbing news uh, that Eugene had called her and uh, something was happening. She didn't divulge anything at that time, uh, but I knew it was kind of serious just because they were making their way from Akron to Columbus to, to investigate this thing. As he waited to find out what was going on, Kevin Jackson began to worry more and more that something had happened to his daughter. And what I did know is, if something, if if Alicia was in trouble and she could have communicated with me, she would have called me. That's for sure. So I was really worried about that. And then eventually I did get the call and uh, uh, I was told that she is, is dead. He would later learn that earlier that night, Eugene had returned home to find Alicia covered in blood brutally murdered. She was stabbed, and she was stabbed brutally. Uh, It wasn't just once, it wasn't just twice. She was stabbed over 30 times, uh, and there were stab wounds across her face, her head, her chest, neck. It was someone who had some sort of personal, emotional, you know, feelings to, from, from, you know, that's kind of how her family described it and what they believe, because to to stab someone the way that that she was stabbed um they you know they believed that of course you, there's got to be some sort of emotion behind that it definitely had to be something personal it definitely had to be something emotional um there were things done to her while my sister was alive during that um you know during her murder and then there were things that were done post mortem as well And so there had to be some really strong emotions on the part of who did this that were personal against Alicia and not just a, you know, a break in or a robbery or anything like that. Sitting in a high chair nearby, Eugene found his two year old son unharmed. Not only was she murdered, but she was murdered in front of her her own son, who was sitting in in a high chair. He was two years old the night that this happened. One by one. Family members received the news. Alicia's brother, Trevin, was in college in North Carolina and remembers it was right around finals time when he got a call from his mom. And she sounded very frantic. And I'm not used to her really sounding this way. 
And so she gave me the news over the phone and it was really a moment of shock and just uh, not being able to understand what's going on or how this happened or why this happened or when this happened. So I think it was shock initially and just um, a long list of questions of how it all went down. Shantae, Alicia's cousin, was also in school at the time and remembers getting the call from her uncle. He called me and it was just, he said, Alicia's, he was vague, Alicia's not here with us. And, you know, you're like, who do you mean? You know, and he said, she passed away. And I'm like, what? And I actually remember terminating the call at that moment. And I had to gather my thoughts. It didn't take long, a couple minutes, because now I'm like, okay, I got to call back. What do you mean? So then I called back and he told me she was murdered. And at that point, um... I was in shock. The true emotions that I felt weren't displayed at that time, and they probably never were displayed until, you know, months later. It was a state of shock, like how, uh, not Alicia, that just was something I could not comprehend, although we knew it was, you start seeing the news the next day, it's all over, you know, the news out, you know it's real, you, you know it, but you're like, how? After he received the news, Alicia's father, Kevin Jackson, remembers going off to one of the bedrooms in his home to be by himself. And I remember sitting on a bed in one of the other bedrooms, and I had this this vision of Leisha fading off into the distance. And she said, goodbye, Daddy, I'll see you soon. I haven't told a lot of people that, but it was like, it was final as far as I'm concerned in terms of her being here in this earth uh, on her way to the to heaven and uh, the world beyond. His family was left not only grieving for their loss, but not knowing why it happened or who was responsible. I think the, sh- the challenges thereafter were just huge. Um, trying to figure out who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, I didn't personally see her, of course, because I'm in Harrisburg. And this thing happened in Columbus. Uh, which I'm glad I didn't because I can't imagine, I don't want to imagine what it would have been like to see her in the scene, uh, the crime scene itself. From what I'm hearing, uh, that it was just blood everywhere. Uh, I I can't can't imagine that. So um, all I remember is after some investigation from the detective asking some questions, my focus after that was just preparing for the funeral. Alicia's funeral was held in Pennsylvania, and loved ones traveled from all over the country to be there. Usually I would go through things, and one of my main support bases was my sister, Alicia. And so that was the main difficulty, realizing that I'm going through something. I wanted to call her, I wanted to text her, and I expected her, I I almost subconsciously expected her to be there when I was going back home for her her funeral and I had to keep telling myself that no this is her funeral you're going to and you're not going to be able to have that support there that you're used to. During this time investigators in Ohio had been processing the scene and found Alicia's laptop and phone were missing but almost unbelievably the rest of the townhome seemed to be left undisturbed. Everything else seemed like the night was still going on the stove was still on the TV was still on. Um, those bills were still on the counter. It just kind of seemed like everything else looked normal, besides the fact that it was a huge crime scene. And there was something else that stood out, something that wasn't there. There was no evidence of forced entry. There being no evidence of a forced entry, it makes it gives you the assumption that Alicia went to that door, whether it was you know a doorbell ringing, a knock on the door, so however. You know, that person made it, a, made it known that they were there. Alicia went to the door and she was the one who let them in. So it had to have been someone she knew because, or at least trusted enough to open up the door and let them into her home because she was the only person home besides her son. And of course, her son is two. He is in a high chair. He wasn't letting the person in. And whoever that person was... They covered their tracks. They did not find a murder weapon at the scene, and there has not been a weapon recovered up until this point. Um, The only DNA evidence that they were able to find in the apartment was, besides Alicia's, was Eugene's, which her fiancé, and then I believe his brother also. 
Um, but they have both been cleared as suspects. They, you know, were questioned. They took lie detector tests. Um, and they, have at this point, are not, are not suspects. They've been cleared. According to the family, no other suspect DNA was found in the home. Whoever did it really were skilled at covering themselves. And it, was, it had to be a premeditated thing because you're just not that good in something that just happened spontaneous. They definitely, as my uncle said, covered their tracks. Um, that's all we can say. You know, so many people are like, in a, in, like, how? There's no DNA, there's no blood. Yes, there was a lot of blood. None of it was hers. None of it was theirs. It was all Alicia. To date, no charges have been filed and no suspects or persons of interest have ever been publicly named. Retired detective Steve Eppert led the case in its early days. And although he's been tight-lipped, he recently spoke about the case on a podcast with students at an Ohio high school. He did speak with the students at this at this high school on their podcast. And he said that, um, you know, as far as Eugene, the fiance, and his brother, they took polygraph tests and ran down their alibis and, you know, were able to clear them as suspects. But other than that, I mean don't really know too much about what other avenues were taken. Neighbors didn't hear anything. There was no, there were no surveillance cameras. Um, There was no kind of, of, of eyewitness at all to this. And for Alicia's family members, there's never been any explanation as to why this happened. What could have possibly motivated someone to do this? 12 years later, it still doesn't make any sense. So Alicia was an awesome person. And, you know, don't take my word for it. Any other interview, you will see the consistency of who she was and where her heart was. She was a selfless person. And I think that's uh, part of the reason why uh, with a situation like hers where someone came in with no forced entry, I think it would have had to been someone who she knows and probably was trying to help out or um, come to some sort of resolution. Um, but she, she was an all-around good person and really didn't deserve this. 12 years is a long time, but this family has not given up on finding answers. So it's been like a looming question mark in the back of my mind for the last 12, you know, almost 12 years. And I think some of the emotions and hurt of her loss is gone. And now I just want to see a person brought to, you know, the consequences of them taking her life because they hurt a lot of people in the process. And I'm just looking for justice for my sister, Alicia. The hope is that with these kinds of bringing bringing the case up again and getting the public talking about it, that, you know, word of mouth is kind of their only hope right now. Word of mouth is all we have. We are not going to find that knife. We're not going to find Alicia's laptop and phone that were stolen from her townhouse that time. We're not going to get a confession at this point. And so anyone who's got any type of information about what happened to her, please speak up. Anything helps. The biggest to the smallest thing. And all we're looking for is to have some answers uh, and have justice for Alicia. Nothing will ever bring her back. But having the answers of who did this to her will help us all have more peace around this situation. Do you hear that? That's the Infinity QX50's way of saying hello as it unlocks the door for you and invites you inside. Now you're comfortably sitting down and cooling down in your climate-controlled, quilted seat. Surrounded by empowering technology, you can set your drive mode and the mood. When I popped off, then your girl gave me just a little bit of baby so cold. Looking for your next adventure? NerdWallet helps you compare travel and cashback cards to turn your everyday purchases into your next unforgettable experience. NerdWallet is a personal finance company whose mission is to provide clarity for all of life's financial decisions. NerdWallet can help you find the best credit cards, up your credit score, land the perfect mortgage, and so much more. They make it incredibly easy to learn all about finance with thousands of articles covering every facet of personal finance. 
With NerdWallet, you can compare and shop for financial products that are the right fit for you without anything to worry about because it's completely free to sign up. Tell the NerdWallet team more about you, and they'll recommend things like the best credit card for your spending habits, simple ways to up your credit score, and more. So don't wait. Get information from an award-winning team of 80-plus nerds to make even the most complicated money questions and topics easy to understand. Find the smartest financial products for you on NerdWallet.com. That's NerdWallet.com. Or in app stores by downloading the NerdWallet app. For True Crime Chronicles, I'm Will Johnson, along with Reed Redman. Thanks for listening, as always, and just want to remind all of our listeners that we are back after a brief break in July. We are here weekly with new episodes. Reed wanted to follow up on this case just a little bit, had a few questions. What we heard from Alicia Jackson's family is that investigators believe her killer was someone who knew her, but it sounds like when they've investigated those closest to her, they've really come up with nothing. That's right, Will. Police have confirmed to Fox 43 that Alicia's fiance, Eugene Wilson, is not a suspect in her murder. And as we heard from Alyssa Kratz, his brother's DNA was also found in the home, but police cleared him as well. So yeah, they're kind of stuck asking who else in this person's life would possibly have any reason to do something like this. And, you know, the more that you hear about the type of person Alicia was, it's easy to see why that would be a really difficult question to answer. This was someone that seemingly everyone around her liked and kind of gravitated towards. And as we heard from Alyssa, investigators have remained tight-lipped about this investigation. Do we know if they consider this a cold case? That's a good question, considering how much time has passed, 12 years at this point. Police have said that the investigation not only remains open, but remains active. So no, it doesn't sound like they consider it a cold case, but you know, how active is it? Are they potentially closing in on a suspect behind the scenes? We don't know. And that's why this family has been trying to get Alicia's story out there. Yeah, and that's what we heard from Alicia's cousin Shantae when she said word of mouth is all the family has at this point. And sometimes that's what's needed to bring answers in a case like this. You never know. Just before the family was interviewed for this story with Fox 43, they'd also done an interview with People Magazine. And when Alyssa interviewed Shantae, she talked about the family being hopeful about people all over the country seeing the story in line at the grocery store, wherever, and and maybe thinking, oh, I have a friend who lives in Ohio or family out in Ohio. I'll talk to them about this story. And you never know where that might lead. If anyone listening to this has any information on the murder of Alicia Jackson, tips can be submitted anonymously online at Central Ohio Crime Stoppers. Their website is www.stopcrime.org or by calling Crime Stoppers at 614-461-8477 or toll-free at 1-877-645-8477. All right, Reed, thanks for bringing us the case this week, and thanks for listening to True Crime Chronicles. We are here every Monday with new episodes. And if you haven't listened to our daily podcast, The Daily Crime, you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts, new episodes every weekday, Monday through Friday. For True Crime Chronicles, along with Reed Redman, I'm Will Johnson. We'll be back next week with a new case and a new story.